that meaning, that purpose as part of your business model is not some social responsibility that you just patch on, on, on after you have kind of, you know, tear down all the trees. It's like, you know, uh, and I think these companies also, and that, that's, a, that's a, you know, if you continue to have that type of short-term thinking in your business, I do not believe that you're here in the next five years. Ida Thlaltbakken is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Ida is co-founder of Catapult Future Fest and Catapult Cloud Conference and community platforms. Ida is actively engaged in social impact communities and projects around the world. She is a public speaker and writer about technology, urbanity, and gender equality. As a former partner at Nordic Impact and the Catapult Group, she worked with impact investing and supporting solutions, conversations around technology and businesses used for good. With her education and training in philosophy, history, and pedagogics, she has a robust human-driven approach to technologies and how to apply them to solve society's complicated issues. Summer of 2019, she chose to push the pause button, seek deeper in her spiritual practice, work and readings, creating more headspace, time for meditation practice and con connecting to nature. She has gained more awareness and strength to collaborate and hold space for social impact work Ida, welcome. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here with you. It is so great to have you. Just for our listeners, you're coming live to us from Costa Rica, and I'm, I'm <laughs> jealous. I'm in cold <laughs> Hamburg, Germany. It's snowing and been snowy and cold, and you probably just came from swimming, as I heard, and, and uh, experienced some, some good weather. Yeah, uh, that's right. This morning I went out at uh, 5 30 uh, and I surfed. So I paddled out on my surfboard, watched the sunset. And yeah, as you said, you know, connecting to nature. Um, and it's really wonderful. I took the choice of going here this year. I've been traveling here to Costa Rica for about 20 years. Uh, it has a, has a really special place in my heart. And of course, it was a difficult decision to do this year. Uh, but I did. So I've been here since November uh, 2020, and I will stay throughout May. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So are, are you where are you originally from? And do you have like a second home there? Or kind of tell us, you're, you're kind of this global citizen. So uh, we originally met, uh, uh, well, a, a long time ago through other connections through Kinternet at H Farm in Venice. And then we the last saw each other in Copenhagen and in, in, in Denmark at a uh, future IO event, which was which was really beautiful as well. And, and uh, since then, we've begun to both been in, in lockdowns and not seeing yeah. much, but our but our paths have crossed over the year. But you're kind of this global citizen doing a bunch of different things. Can you catch us up to speed on, on what your world looks like? Uh, I guess home is where my heart is um, uh, at any given moment. But yeah, I originally born in Colombia. I was adopted to Norway uh, when I was one and a half year old. So I grew up in Norway until I was four. Between I was four and 12, I lived in Denmark on a small island called Bornholm. Uh, which is a beautiful little place uh, filled with artists and um, that time a lot of pottery ceramics a little bit hippie-ish the whole environment there so I was there until I was 12 moved back to Norway and I would say most of my grown-up independent life I have been seeking out I have been traveling and just you know curious on the world now for the last 10 years I've been more like 
in Oslo, but you know, before before the pandemic, traveling a lot, so always in different conferences that you said we met in outside of Venice in H Farm, and then later, like I think a year later, we met again in Copenhagen. So that was like really, a, you know, my way of working and life and, and being part of these communities of communities and, and connecting for social good. And, um, but I still have my base in, in Norway. But the last year I've been kind of moving towards dividing my, my, my year in half. So half of my time here in Costa Rica and half of my time in uh, Oslo, Norway. Well, I couldn't think of two two more beautiful places to to spend your time. So I think you're you're doing something right for sure. With, with all your experience, and I know I could have uh, read a much longer biography because you've been doing some wonderful things for a while now, and especially around uh, Catapult Future Fest and Catapult Cloud Conference, and and some of the things that you do around community building and really. Uh, speaking and writing about, you know, uh, urbanity and gender equality and uh, empowering women and girls and things. Uh, has any of that given you resilience and helped you to weather this crazy time our world's experience in the last 12 plus months? I, and I'm not just talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about Black Lives Matters and Belarus and the inauguration in the U.S. and the Trumpocalypse and all the other many other things I could go on and on craziness going on around the world. Has that helped you uh, kind of that experience and that breadth of experience and knowledge that you had in the past? Does that help you weather this time any better or give us an update and tell us how it's been? Wow, that's a very good question. And I think there's also many answers because it's so several layers. Uh, but I had this kind of aha moment when I was still in Oslo in June last year and um, I think yeah I work a lot with people from the west coast and I was on a zoom call with a, a person in California and then all the wild, wildfires was going on and this person you know it's the wildfires it's locked down it was just a lot for them and then you have you know uh the, the 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 past president you know tweeting and coming with you know all these well uh messages all over mask no mask and all these things and i remember that moment when we we i kind of turned off the the zoom call and i was like looking around myself like in my living room or my office space there in oslo in my home and thinking, oh my God, I'm so happy that I'm from Norway right now, because that country, and I've, I've turned like kind of a, like a little bit patriotic the last year to, to go to circle back to your question, because I feel that living in Norway, it's a welfare state, it's up in the Nordics. Uh, we have uh, honest, it's a high level of trust. We trust our uh, politicians. We trust them to actually work for the benefit of us. And that gives me headspace and that gives me resilience. And then of course, it's you know my own spiritual practice and journey and that personal uh, work that we, I think I would encourage everyone to do, uh, you know, it's to, to actually stay steady and calm uh, in storm and unpredictable times and, and complex times because that, that's a whole other story, but it, it, it is the practices that supports us. But in that moment in June, I felt like, okay, I'm here, I'm safe, I'm good in this country and it can help me to stay sober because I think that's also one of the things that we need to do. We, we can react from a place of fear, right? And I'm so happy that I like have a country that can contextualize that for me. And then as on a personal level, having these spiritual practices, meditation and so on every day that can, you know, ground me back every morning. Like every morning I get up at 4 a.m. and I sit and, and meditate for an hour. And it just, you know, I enter the day with some, some clarity and that helps me having resilience. And of course, I grew up with artists, so there's nothing that is predictable in that context. So I don't even get, I don't get that shaken by 
not knowing because I think and also as a creative interdisciplinary uh, growth mindset thinker that I am I actually get a little bit energized. So I was like, you know, what are what are these patterns, and and how can we leverage that and all that society, and then meeting, you know, things with growth mindset and curiosity. I think that's also part of being able to stay more resilient um, in in not only this year but you know in general, because it is massive what we are, you know, uh, living in right now with information overflow and and um, stuff like that. Yeah. That's great. Do you, uh, your work with impact investing and impact, uh, the Nordic impact in general, was that more specific for Nordic um, startups and entrepreneurs or was that global work that you kind of dealt with uh, people from all over the world? Yes, they're dealing with people from all over the world. So Nordic Impact was the company that started and established, established Catapult. So we kind of went from Nordic Impact to Catapult. And now everything is organized in Catapult Foundation, Catapult Group, and Catapult X. I was part of starting, which is Catapult, the previous Catapult Future Fest. I was part of starting Catapult Future Fest. And now we are uh, leveling up to Catapult X. And our goal there is to build an, uh, I would say, a trailblazer, an impact influencer machinery for good that is focusing on how to use the tool of money, uh, which is within the strategy of impact investing uh, and the tool of technology and emphasizing tools for both of them and money and technology, they are tools and they can be used for get good and they can be used for bad. We will, you know, try to have people use them for something that is beneficial for people and planet and not, you know, exploding, exploiting us, uh, either our brains or our, you know, uh, the way we work or the way we live or the consumerism or um, Mother Earth, right? The, the planet, which we are dependent on, all of us. And uh, then the third pillar, which is consciousness. And I think that part of the work were for me kind of came up through after Catapult Future West 2018. Uh, I always create like taglines for myself that are. Um, kind of creative, uh, putting creative boundaries for myself. So I created this tagline. So the first year we created a uh, catapult, I came up with the tagline, the future is now, because it felt like this. And it felt like this for us also, you know, doing catapult for the first time back in 2017. Uh, so we wanted to create an urgency about, you know, ethical and existential conversation around tech and, and bringing the humanities in. And the second year I came up with the tagline, the future is human. And it still wasn't enough for me somehow. I think from a personal like place as well. I think I've been I can maybe speak about that a little bit later, but but I'm talking about love these days and starting with self-love, but also putting love as KPIs and 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 really, you know, uh being articulate that you know if you come from a place of love from our intentions uh i always say like we can't predict the future but we can set our intentions right and i think if we put our our parameters from love there's a lot of things that we can do with technology and and money or capital right so the consciousness part for me came up from a thought that wow we have you know the 2030 agenda there's not much time. Are we going to be able to fix this? Are we only going to be able to make this? And I was like, I don't think we will. Not if we can't figure out ourselves first. So I was like, maybe we need SDGs for emotions. Maybe we uh, you know, need to have that conversation, that like inner work. And I think it kind of biased because I needed it, frankly, to be honest, myself as well. So I came up with the tagline, the future is you. And that's where when Catapult became even stronger around the consciousness part. So for Catapult X, our goal is to have like a larger it's, I don't like the word influencer, uh, actually not the machinery, but I don't know really, like I've been thinking like media house, but at least like say ecosystem that can put on the agenda, the combination of 
money as a, as a tool that we can use for good. We still have the existing capitalist system that we know of. Uh, we probably have to reimagine that a little bit as well. Uh, we have technology that we can choose to use for something that is beneficial for people and planets. And then we have that part of the consciousness. And I think these needs to work together. So that's uh, where we're heading now. We just hired a, an excellent, wonderful CEO to do that work. And um, want to, you know, connect with uh, all organizations that is doing that type of work. And also what we also do then to circle back to Nordic Impact, we have in the group two accelerators uh, we have, we do some direct investments. Uh, we are having some initiatives in Mauritius right now and things are building there. So that's our action, you know, uh, part and also our commercial part. Catapult Tex is a, is, a, is a nonprofit. And then we have the Catapult Foundation as well, which is a nonprofit. Um, so yeah, that was a long, long answer, but I call it the uh, catapult universe uh, because I think we need to, to, to work on many layers. Yeah, again, the complexity, right? With, you have to, to, to change the system. Maybe you have to, you know, systems need to take talk to each other, kind of. Exactly. And it was, it's, for me, it's never too long of an answer. So I really appreciate <laughs> you getting into the depth and actually what it, what it makes me there, there's a couple, so not only with the question I asked prior, there's kind of, I'm leading you on a journey of, of what, what we want to discuss, discuss and kind of unpeel the layers uh, and get into a little bit more sense making of, of what you've been working on in your journey. And so um, before I go to the next step of, of, of that question, kind of, of what you've experienced, you touched on a couple things in there that I want to, to dive deeper into or ask you a little bit more about it one you 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 said you were very fortunate to to live in the nordics and to in, in mm. denmark and and that you felt secure and that was such a different feeling for for you from what you were seeing other people and on a zoom call what other people around the world were experiencing some extreme craziness and extremely hard times um uh, but that they were blessed with that, that fortunate ability. And, and as well as, you know, now in Costa Rica, there's some, uh, there's, you know, different ways to live. What, and I don't know how we can tickle on this a little bit more or discuss it properly. Don't you have this overwhelming feeling that we need a world that works for everyone, not just people on Costa Rica or in Denmark or in Germany or in Finland or, or wherever it is that that might be beautiful or have a good social infrastructure, good government or good policies. Um, because aren't, aren't we all on this spaceship earth? And so how, how with your impact work, with what you're doing with, with a catapult and, and what you just described and the next questions about consciousness. So I don't know if you can separate those two mm. before we get into more uh, more of that how how do you wrangle with those feelings i'm i'm a person where i i uh, i can't stand knowing that there are other people with not the same rights that i have and i'm not saying i have them all but it, it mm. just it, it, it's very frustrating for me because i feel like a global citizen i feel like those are distant cousins and that there are no nations and borders. We're all on the same planet earth. And I would like that equality for all in that uh, <clears throat> a world that works for everyone. So that, you know, uh, we don't have to feel like, oh, well, the only place that's gonna be good to hide or to, to feel safe is we need to all go to Denmark. That's not gonna hold the whole world, but how can we create a whole world or a whole earth that works for everyone where we don't, have those type of things and so those are the kind of the things I deal with and so I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into to what you know what you said you had those feelings and and and, and you kind of went back into yourself and more meditation and kind of taking care of yourself but how can we help our other distant cousins uh, around the world to to be in a world that really works for everyone 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I, I have the exact same feeling. And I think one of the largest challenges that we have um, is inequality, right? In the world that it's like this world is not evenly, the wealth in this world is not evenly distributed. It can be, and it should be. And um, we all have, and I, since I, you know, when I think about myself, like I was adopted from Colombia, like my journey is so long, right? And I'm so fortunate here I am in a warmer climate. And I think it's genetically, like I need to be here. It, it's where like my, my, my skin, my hair, my everything like thrives, right? Not in the colder climate like Norway. So I kind of have done a circle and I'm so fortunate that I can do that. And I, in my impact work and my spiritual practice, I think I, that's what I'm dedicating my life to, 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 to work so we can all have the same opportunity to uh, cover, well, first and foremost, basic needs, right? And then, you know, education, and then the opportunity to thrive and all these uh, other things that we as humans are, have the, the heart and the minds and the souls and the cognitive abilities to, to be, right? Actualizing human beings to, to thrive uh, where they are in, in this world and together with nature and together with this planet without uh, feeling that um, uh, there's a, there's a, as a like we, we could be able to shape this world so we all can live in a place of uh, abundancy, right? It's it's here, but now we're over, you know, we're pressing the, the planetary boundaries, and so we don't have. So I think that's extremely important. I like in the work of of catapult. Uh, so one thing is like concrete, like catapult futurist. I have always created that very diverse. So and I don't mean like only gender, but it's like uh, geographically um uh, age disciplines uh and having these and being very specific on having uh into the generations that is cross-disciplinary and that can get everyone voices heard because it's in that mix of these conversations that we maybe can spark collaborations uh we can find you know communicate and and create understanding because i think a lot of this is also understanding each other, you know, and recognizing each other. And as you said, to your point of like, aren't we all the same? It's like, sometimes it feels like we are thinking that, oh no, we're not the same, right? But if we could, you know, create that empathy, then we will understand like, well, and I'm circling back to love again, right? <laughs> it's like that, then we are, um, I think more, uh, <laughs> I would think we will be more geared into working for all of us instead of this extreme individualism. So, and then Catapult the Accelerators, uh, we pick companies from all over the world, a lot of companies from Africa, a lot of Asia, there's one from Costa Rica some years ago. Uh, and in that mix as well, that is about supporting founders from all over the world that ha have solutions. And very often these solutions are uh, answers to local uh, challenges that they want to solve, these founders. And then uh, helping them in, in scaling their business uh, and also investing in them. So I think we need to have the conversations that are, you know, uh, building empathy and understanding and collaboration. And then we have, you know, the actions as well, which is the investing, which is the tools and so on. Uh, so I'm dedicating my, my, my life to this work uh, and I find deep meaning and purpose in it. That's beautiful. So this leads nicely to what you already tickled upon with with the consciousness, and that's kind of the new framework. But but you you mentioned so eloquently that without the basic needs, without meeting everyone's basic needs, there's uh, it makes it extremely difficult to raise to 
to gain another level of consciousness or to even have collective consciousness, so to say, to align with others, because you're so worried about the basic needs of food, breathing, food, water, safety, security, many, many things. Um, so can you explain a little bit more what, what you mean about consciousness, what that journey looks like, how you're trying to, to make that transformation or transition to help um, pick people up where they're at to take them on this journey? And, and what, what does that exactly mean for you and, and what you're working on with, with that consciousness? If you, can, if you can for us, that would be great. Mm, yeah, wow, I have to sit with it a little bit. Uh, what I'm, like every morning when I'm, you know, so I have, I have, um, I have two practices that I do that I think everyone can do. Uh, and every, every, every night before I go to sleep, I put my hand on my heart and, and say, I love you. I don't say it out loud. Uh, uh, I, sometimes I do, uh, but um, I will say it to my spiritual body, I will say it to the room, I will say it to my physical body, and then practicing that, that self-love. In the morning when I wake up, I put my hand on my heart and I, I just say, thank you. I like, you know, I'm practicing gratitude. And then I go and, and, and meditate. And I think that meditation practice is for me about connecting to, to the energy, connecting to, well, nature, connecting to, and with nature I also mean ourselves, right? Uh, and, and, finding that inner voice, you know, some call it light, some call it, call it God, some call it, uh, you know, the chakras, some call it just what's in the ether, like, you know, connecting like the mycelia, you know, and then from that, that place, um, developing and, and I will say honoring and, 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 and growing that compassion, that empathy for everything being. Uh, and I think with that, with that meaning, with that understanding, with that purpose, with that connection, I feel that I'm on a path where I can connect with, you know, everyone. And that, as you said, like, there is no borders. There is like, it's, it's all one. And if we can tap into that space, rest in that space and really, truly, truly understanding we are all one. I think from that, or at least for me, in my experience, it has really helped me come from a place of true, true, and tensions and, and, and meaning and purpose and goodwill for everyone. And that's where I, I find my strength in um, continuing this work. Uh, and I am not going to, like I could, for example, and I, it would probably be lovely to do one there, maybe like, you know, go up in a mountain and meditate for a year, right? Uh, and, and just kind of like the old sages did, you know, like, uh, but, I think for me and and I hope for more people with these practices that we actually, when we have them and we're connected to them, that we apply them and we share them because I don't think this is a is a nice to have. I think it is something that we we need. Uh, I think this moment in time is a spiritual moment, um, and, and spirituality can be so much right uh, and i'm i'm not afraid of using words like spirituality love and so on because i think that could also a lot of happens in language um and uh, now being in a moment where we are quite secularized where many of us have then you know lived through a year of wow just happened, right? And again, as we started out, we're talking today about like, how do you stay resilient? And I think a lot of these practices uh, is important for the resilience, the collective resilience of humankind, 
And also as a consequence of COVID, I, I think we're looking towards a, a mental health, a big mental health challenge. Uh, it's underlying. I don't think we have seen the beginning of it. And, but then we still have climate crisis and, and we still have inequalities and all the other, you know, SDGs that we need to work for. And we can't do that if we are not resilient. So that's uh, where I use my consciousness work, very focused in particular, and do not run off in a cave and meditate. Although I would love to do that at one point, <laughs> but not yeah. now. I, I see, well, there's a couple, couple more things that you've unpacked that I'd like to address. So when I, I talk about resilience quite a bit, there's quite a few definitions of, of resilience. So there's the the personal resilience of mental and physical, um, emotional resilience, where if someone spits on you or hits you or um, verbally abuses you or physically abuses you, that you have the resilience to survive and, and be, come back and, and, and um, get through that type of, of trauma or, or, or that type of resilience. But then there's the other type of resilience is like a very dystopian resilience where you are still surviving in the future but you're doing it with a gas mask a spacesuit your the the your environment is so toxic whatever whatever it is um that it's not it's not a normal life it's more of a dystopian you've got some kind of artificial support allowing you to live like a spacesuit or a, a gas mask or an oxygen mask or or something like that to enjoy uh, continuing to live, which is, to me wouldn't be very big enjoyments, more dystopian. Or there's this resilient, desirable way to live. And that's one where we, we change the way we live by using uh, renewables and non-finite resources. We start to live within planetary boundaries. We start to live sustainably, which gives us a form of resilience or even when we think regenerative uh, practices give us a lot of resilience because the, the earth is always regenerating itself and we're living with as one planet living in a circular economy. And so um, th there's a few other definitions of resilience and I won't go into them, but there's um, so many people are, you know, uh, are not well defined with even the basic terms that when they hear resilience, and I think one of the main ones you or you were describing, tell me if you're wrong, was the one of mental, emotional, physical type of resilience, or did you mean more of a, a worldview, circular economy, regenerative, you know, a world that is still beautiful, but we're not doing at the cost of human suffering and fossil fuels and, and uh, environmental destruction? Oh. I'll answer that, and I think it's it's connected, and and I I I can come this from my own experience and a, and a very personal perspective on it. I I was exhausted. I wasn't happy. I had uh, my body said like uh, this is six years ago. My my, my body said like uh, gave me something called vertigo. It's like some crystals in your air that it gets loose, and then like the whole world is just like you know you're just total vertigo, right? And I had to figure out what that was. And yeah, absolutely. It came from stress. It came from overworking. It came from, you know, not living my life accordingly to, you know, my, my nature uh, at all. Even though like, you know, high achiever and from successful in, in, in many layers, right? But I didn't have that. And I, to be honest, I didn't have that self-love practice. So that's why I also came back to that self-love love practice. And then for the gas mat point, like, you know, you have to put it on yourself and then you can su support uh, others. Um, so I needed to, to, to do that work first for myself and then that transformation. Uh, with myself uh, and it doesn't come easy it's been many years with you know digging deep uh, in my psychology and my physiology understanding more about neuroscience understanding more of meditation uh, having discipline and so on you know and uh, but then when I realized oh my god this is really really supporting me but another consequence of that is that I 
and I don't know if this is gonna sound woo woo, but like here in Costa Rica, like I literally don't have anything. I'm renting this place that I'm living in. The, the most expensive thing that I have is the Mac that I'm talking to you about uh, with on now and my surfboard. And I actually, you know, I, I, my, my, I live an extremely minimalistic life uh, and I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, and I, I really are cautious about not being, being wasteful to, to the point of, you know, not using too much. And I, you know, I eat vegan food and to using uh, too much of our, um, and living within the planetary boundaries, right? That we have, and, and for me as one single individual, not being a, a consumer that is not being sustainable on this, this uh, for this planet that we are on. So I think that awareness and that consciousness around my actions has also come through me, through my spiritual practice and a practice that literally my physical body said like, you need to do this because you're not treating yourself sustainable. So it's if you look at it holistically uh, and that's, I, I think to truly understand, well, the, the beauty, the limitations and the need for taking care of ourselves and with ourselves, I mean, the planet. Um, uh, we need to scale down. And, and that's also what I have done. And, and, and my conscious and spiritual practice has, has learned me to scale down because I find more beauty in less. That's so beautiful. Let me let me veggie back on to what you just said, if possible. So, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. So, what I what I'm hearing is first, you need to to get an alignment, have your own resilience, get back in in uh, your own consciousness, in order to be part of the collective consciousness that seems mm -hmm. to be emerging more. And I, I'll, I, I, um, if, if that's correct, how do you see this? I, I see a, a, a new emergence, uh, you know, not, a, not even just the one that Carl Sagan said, you know, the, the, there's this new consciousness emerging that the seeing the earth as one organism and, and an organism divided amongst itself is doomed or at war with itself that is doomed. And I'm, I'm seeing, you know, in this, this great crazy time where we're seeing, you know, the, the, like this world is really not working for a lot of us. Um, we're feeling this civil unrest, this dis-ease with the civilization frameworks in our world that we're also feeling this extreme rising consciousness a collective consciousness of people saying hey this is enough this old systems aren't working for us anymore we need new civilization frameworks that are working for all of us that are working for all of humanity um is, is that kind of correct on the, this path this journey that you're on and and how are you seeing this new rise of uh, of collective consciousness no, I think you're right. And uh, so, so the so the tagline for the the fourth year when we had to pivot to to catapult clown because we were planning a physical event. So we went. So then I went from the future is you, right? We need to have that uh, personal transformation. To the future is one, and then you know having those conversation of that oneness. And I work a lot about uh, around the the uh, the the word belonging. And then like, how can we feel that belonging, that the place in the organism? Because I think that's what, what is it about as well. Like this, this uh, emerging new uh, collective consciousness, because frankly, like you, many religions, they are serving a, pers a purpose of, of, of belonging, of, of collective. Of, of groups so we can we can feel supported right it's about support and feel, being held uh, but then when we have uh, science and technology and then you know 
we are like connected to our iPhones and you know there, there's so many things that is I will almost call them an almost synthetic or artificial kind of belonging or, or answering to that like need inside of us it's not like it's not giving us love it's not giving us connection it's not giving us meaning but it's like uh keeping us occupied so we don't dig deeper into you know what is it that we are missing why do we feel lonely why don't we feel why don't do we feel disconnected and i think this you know new uh, collective uh, consciousness it might be the 21st century's kind of version of um a, a, a new well spiritual practice a new i wouldn't say religion but a, a spiritual practice right that that we can tap in to with our 21st century uh, culture brain and i think to your point also do we do, what more do we need i think we need new social contracts i need to we need to revisit like uh uh the existing usage of capitalism that we we have now uh we need to rethink uh you know the existing political systems are, are they still you know uh, working for us are they still serving us uh education big one right so all these systems these social constructions in the system that we have built over the last you know uh, i would say since the industrial revolution and maybe a little bit earlier right uh we need to create i would say new maybe existential new narrative a new languages around how we speak about ourselves how we speak about society and what kind of future we want to create and and how we want to you know pass on this planet to future generations because right, what we're doing right now that is not working and i think we kind of all know that and from that that new collective awareness work is emerging like this it's very simple like this is not working okay but what do we do right so so there's something that we wanted there's there's more and more people thinking we want something different we want to live differently. Um, we want to come out of this place that we can see with our eyes that is not good. But I think we need to help each other because we are also so dependent on our capital system. Many are of wealth on this system. Uh, many people have positions and 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 also how we view humans, right? Like I would say now, like the corner office is dead. The Wolf of Wall Street is, is dead. The companies uh, need to be sustainable uh, or environmental and, and, and uh, taking care of people and planet. Uh, because I think if not, they will not be competitive, but it's hard because that's a culture shift and shifting culture that sits deep, that sits, inside every single one of us. And that is very, very hard to shift. But, and that's why we need, I think, spiritual practices to, to help us get through that, to that next collective new um, commonalities around what do we want? Do we really want this? Or do we actually want to be, you know, um, more caring to ourselves and our surroundings. Well, I, I mentioned it earlier, what, what Carl Sagan said, you know, that the, the consciousness is uh, uh, seeing the earth as a single organism. But he also said a couple other things that I think are very fitting towards this, this, uh, this collective consciousness, this collective intelligence, but also this emergence that, that we're seeing is that truly, we are all star stuff. We're all stardust. We're all um, we're we're actually a way for the cosmos and the universe to know itself. So w what that means is that the basic elements of life that you can find in our body, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, um, calcium, those are all um, iron. Those are all 
the basic elements of life, but they're also the basic elements of our earth. They're the basic elements that we received as stardust in the formation of this earth. And we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. We weren't dropped off by Mars or Venus or any other place. We crawled out of this earth. We are born in this earth and, 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 and we're part of it. And so this consciousness is not only uh, separate or di different than, than the earth, we are integrally, deeply tied to our earth. And, and, and um, there's this term comes actually from Carl Sagan's um, first wife, Lynn Margulis, and, and uh, it's called symbiotic earth. Mm. We are part of a symbiotic earth. The birth of earth to today began with bacteria and microbes. And, and that's how we crawled out of this prim primordial soup is because we're closely tied to our earth. And, and what, what I'm really trying to say is if we can realize that we're an integral part of this symbiotic earth and quit distancing ourselves from the earth and the way we live, and that's kind of the capitalistic models that, that we start to think more of an ecological ec economy or natural capital and true cost. And instead of seeing those things that we get out of this earth as resources, but see them as a part of a relationship that we have with our earth where they're, they're not resources, but they're a relationship that we have this very much this symbiotic type of uh, exchange with them that's regenerative, that, that plays upon itself and it is the circle of life and, and creates circular economy, creates this cradle to cradle thought process because there is no thorough way on this earth. And once we've depleted the resources or, or messed up those resources that are here so that nothing can regenerate itself, we've ruined it for ourselves. But there is another way, as you, you've said a couple of times, to live in harmony as a, symbi a symbi homo symbiose, as part of a symbiotic earth, in mm -hmm. harmony, with, with our earth and our planet within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. And you've said it a few times. Mm. And I think that is another form of, of collective consciousness that really says, hey, why, why are we looking for a consciousness somewhere else? We already know we are a way for the cosmos and the universe to know itself. Mm. But we also know we crawled out of this earth. So we're actually, instead of this ego at the top of our earth controlling everything, we're part of an ecosystem. We're integrally part keeping this whole earth spinning and moving and healthy. And during this pandemic, we've really realized that uh, more than ever that our biome of our earth is closely connected to the biome of our body, of our health. And, and that's mm. how we got the pandemic. And that's why it spread so fast because our biome wasn't doing good. And we were doing things that created the pandemic in our biome, which then quickly transferred to the biome of our gut and our, and our body and, and our health. And uh, so it's really interesting how that that's kind of how I look at it and how, how I know also see, I don't just see the doom and gloom, but I see that as a, a wonderful way to, to, to fix and solve our grand, global grand challenges and to to receive this, this uh, collective consciousness and, and integrate ourselves in, in, as part of the solution. Mm, yeah, no, absolutely. Do you think that the world, world resources, I'm, I'm like, is that, like I'm, I'm looking for like, do we need to find other words for this transformation? Well, that's why I liked re a relationship. Instead of a re mm -hmm. resource, it's a relationship. I don't, I don't yeah. think it's a, I, I think it should be a relationship. You would, you would see it and use it differently if you thought of it yeah. as a relationship instead of as just, oh no, that's just a resource and it's there for us. And, but if it's a relationship that's give and take back and forth, it's a whole different view. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I think I like that very much. And I think that's where we also need to have these conversations that, and, and changing the word because well words also changes our thoughts you know and and changes and 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 unpacking what we're allowed to feel and then i, I think 
there's a lot of conversation around leadership these days, right? And I think uh, like we have all, we have, we have the science, we have the knowledge, we have, you know, we have the things that we need to change this situation around uh, for us. It's, it's a matter of, um, it's a matter of, well, will, and I think it's a matter of, of leadership as well. But then when we have, you know, if we could have more conscious leadership, which is much of the leadership that we have seen has been very transactional, has been very like, you need to, you know, you need to get your way in the corner office and it doesn't matter in what way you get there as long as you get there because that will give you the position in the society that is rewarded and you're, you're you know, very often not the best human traits are the, are the, are the traits that is, you know, or attitudes that is getting you there, uh, which is being, you know, more ruthless um, or just not be giving, but just taking and, and, and climbing that ladder. And we have been rewarding that type of leadership. And I think also it's a time to, to redefine what is a true leader and what, what type of leaders can be part of creating these new narratives. I think there is a lot of vulnerability. There is a lot of consciousness work in, in um, those conversations as well. And I, I would be interesting to see like, how can we support the people who can be part of driving that shift, uh, this shift from a leadership perspective? I, I totally agree. And I, I, I really see the big shift. I mean, especially during the pandemic for, I mean, a very horrific thing. It's a still awful now with the mutations and everything, but it's been the, the most um, enlightening time ever to see the problems with our systems, to, to have the problems bubble to the surface and to know, for us to know where we need to look to fix them. But really, and the, the emergence of so many people almost waking up to say the, these models that we've been working on in business and, and our corporation and our organization, um, they're bad models. They're, one, they're not necessary, which was proven by the pandemic in most situations. Uh, so much inefficiency, so unnecessary, so mu much micromanaging instead of working as an organism, as a, a, an organization that really is moving in the same direction together, helping, nurturing a, a, as as a community, as a family, as someone that it's not just nine to five, and those are my colleagues, but uh, people on a mission to leave the planet better than they found it on, on, on purpose-driven corporations that are moving more into planetary services. How can we go beyond sustainability and make sure that we we uh, have plenty of resources in the future that we leave the planet better than we found it for future generations that we're thinking 13 generations in our organization that it'll be around and, and thriving and, and creating wonderful services and products to heal our planet, to, to, to drive humanity into better futures. And uh, I really, I see that with all sorts of new leaderships, new paradigm shifts of of how we do our business model. So there's a big shift in business model adjustments to moving towards platform systems, dynamic business models, ones that address the entire organism, the entire organization as a system instead of individual siloed facets of a system. And um, I'm really positively um, not not even surprised just at the results you know i've been speaking about sustainability and environmental social governance for for decades and, and what happens is when usually when i talk to people one it was always lip service they they were like yeah okay we should do that but they never did anything and it was just kind of like that's costly how do we make that transition are we gonna is there is it profitable is it worth it and now all those companies that had done it before the pandemic began 
the proofs in the model, the proofs in the pudding, they all weathered the pandemic uh, better than their conventional counterparts. They, they've come out the other end or still emerging out the under, other end more resilient and, and um, because they're better models and, and they don't need a bailout. Matter of fact, most of them were in positions to pivot during that time to help others in need to provide respirators, to provide masks, to provide personal protection, food, many, many other services, which, were, which is amazing to see. And, and all of them are like, God, we feel so good. And that's such a, it's a different form of consciousness. It's like, wow, that we're getting so much back. We're helping, we're, we're all in this together. And then that shifts others. They're saying, like, well, how did they do that? How did they start? That we need to go on that model, you know? And, that was that's what occurred i'm sure with you as well but with me i i was receiving calls off the hook uh and uh emails mark we should have listened to you what can you do how can you get us back to work and we need to know how to do reporting and how can we make a shift in our plans and and be more environmentally conscious and and and, and do more and and you know how how's that transition and now it's like the the sdgs came out yesterday you know it's the funniest <laughs> thing but i'm so glad it, it's just been a beautiful shift and I'm, I'm sure you've seen that as well yeah no absolutely and uh, and it's so many layers also but again uh, like you, you say with these companies that are able to support uh well the direct crisis or other companies um uh, is, you know, coming from a full cup, coming from a place of meaning, coming from a place of true intention, right? And as you say, like having that meaning, that purpose as part of your business model is not some social responsibility that you just patch on, on, on after you have kind of, you know, tear down all the trees. It's like, you know, uh, and I think these companies also, and that that's a, that's a you know, if you continue to have that type of short-term thinking in your business, I do not believe that you're here in the next five years. Five years. I, yeah. I think that those times are over. The market is not there. The talent will not work with you. Uh, so I think uh, if you haven't <laughs> called Mark or me <laughs> yet, I think you know do that and and fix those. Uh, plans for your for your business because um if not uh, someone else is going to come and take uh, your place i was in you know the famous famous new app clubhouse the other day and i was listening and i do that a lot listening in on conversation on gen sets uh i like if you haven't done it try it uh because they're coming in with a totally different mindset and there was a gen set a VCs conversation and they had like one of the, the the people on the call there was saying like well there is no brand if it's not doesn't have a community and it doesn't uh, is not sustainable and that's a very clear message from a group of people a generation that is now there well that now they're probably using their money uh, their parents money to, to be consumers but they're soon going into the workforce right so they will be the talents and for them that there are uh, that are brands with a clear purpose uh, of treating this planet and ourselves good and that they want to have agency they want to be part of that conversation. It's not about B to B or C to B or B to C, but it's actually from C to B. It's actually consumer to business that we're talking about. And they want to be part of your brand. So I think that's also something that to reflect around. Uh, it, it definitely is. So I have a, a few more big questions for you today, but but this is probably the hardest one that I'll give you and I'll, I'll, um, it's the burning question. It's WTF, the burning question, but it's not the swear word. It's what's the future? And so I, I don't want you to tell me what, what you think the US's future is or Denmark's future. I want you to tell me what you think your future is or the future 
that you're working towards is? What's the future? I think the future is collaborative, first, first and foremost. Yeah. Um, I love that. And you know, that's that symbiotic earth I mentioned. That's mm -hmm. there, there is no neo Darwinism, neoliberalism, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. It is about collaboration, cooperation. It's about seeing ourselves amongst the symbiosis that that that's the way that we go the furthest that's the way that we have the most regenerative long lasting relationships and and and, and uh, survival of the human species is by be, being collaborative those who are soul soul goers or i'll do it myself or you know let's just step on everybody on the way there they don't go very far that 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 model is a dead model that model is a dead model. It's a short time term thinking model. It's an individualistic model and it doesn't have a place in the future. So the future is definitely that organism of collaboration. Uh, and as you say, relationships. Now I really want to uh, get into uh, how, why, what, what is your um, reason for empowering women and girls and talking about gender and, and, and these things. Uh, what sets you on this path? How is that working? What are you seeing the trends even during this pandemic time uh, where the world's moving and where it needs to go? Oh, that's a, a longer, I think it's been throughout life. I, so, I told you about my moving a little bit back from, from Norway and Denmark when I was a kid. Uh, and I moved, when I moved back to, to, to Norway, I moved to my father. He's a writer. He's the kindest man, I must say, that I know of. Like, he, you just look at him and he's just sitting there, you know, serving dinner or breakfast. And he was also the person that was like baking the bread and he was like, you know, and then also creating like this uh, uh, headspace for himself and being a writer with five kids in the house. That was, that was, uh, uh, I still, I still can't really understand how he did it. But, uh, and then I had two older brothers uh, and a little brother and a sister, or a little sister, but my two older brothers and my father, we were kind of the first, kind of for my father's first marriage. So I spent a lot of time with my two older brothers and my, my father. And, and, and these are like my male kind of figures. Uh, and I never, I was like, what, feminism? What, what, why do I need to like, you know, worry about that right and then I ended up in some business situation some um six seven years ago and I was like wow this is what people are, are struggling with I was never in a situation where I didn't felt heard because I was a woman uh like back in my house there was like like it, it wasn't even a thing like I wouldn't I wouldn't, I wouldn't it didn't occur to me so I actually you know I was a little bit shocked and I was like oh this doesn't feel good uh, and then there was this whole big report coming out like we need more female founders and so on and you know all the venture capital goes to 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 men and it's like men investing in men and uh, I was thinking wow okay uh, well maybe we need to start with the money then we women uh, so that's why I was, you know, taking the path into to investment because I, I, I wanted to to see was why is this happening? And then, you know, digging into technology, I was part of creating um, a yearly kind of uh, a day for girls who code, but they were uh, they're between nine and twelve years uh, old. And it's about, it was crazy. It was like 300 of them, like at the same time. And you can imagine that the, the level of sound <laughs> with 300 girls in, in, in like a couple of floors, but they were there, all of them. And the joy and how they just like expressed themselves with, you know, we, we did it more like a maker thing. Uh, so it was like, you know, it wasn't only consumers of technology, but they were like creating things and they would see things move. And so like a science, uh, science day kind of. Uh, 
And when I saw like how they express themselves uh, in a creative way and just like, you know, without the boys there, because the, the, with the boys are there, they, they stay a little bit in the background. I just felt that, oh my God, we need to, and I can, you know, work with this from many layers, like being aware of like always having I, I one of the best compliments I have gotten for catapult actually there was a woman that looked around and she said like and she wasn't even talking to me and it's like you can you can see because I was standing just next to them and it's like you can see that there's a woman that has created this uh, and I think that feminine I would say touch or energy. Uh, now when I'm coming back here to Costa Rica and there's a lot of women here and we're doing a lot of like, you know, caca ceremonies and so on. What I also noticed after having been here all through the pandemic in Costa Rica, coming back in November, I see how collective the women has uh, kind of turned themselves. Like they're really holding space, the women here. It's really strong and it's grounded. So I would say like that strong, grounded, collective oriented, uh, but also vulnerable uh, voice um, uh, on women, I think is so important in this shift as well. And then even for, for, for men that, that are very trained in other ways of, you know, succeeding or being, I think we just have to go in as an example and, and talk more about love and talk more about collaboration and talk more about these things. And I think that's, that's where you can see the importance of uh, the female uh, strength. I agree that I, I always, you know, I talk about the sustainable development goals uh, as uh, really one of our world's first global moonshots and, and plans for the world to reach a, a more desirable, resilient future and to keep us, be, you know, at 1.5 degrees of warming, but as a roadmap, a plan of action. And there's also Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, that kind of says, you know, what are the top 100 things that we could do to draw down human suffering, and our global grand challenges, our global warming issues. Um, and really, the, uh, in the top um, three spots is global food reform, and number two and three is empowering women and girls. And, you know, a lot of time we get the, the question back, well, well, why is it empowering women and girls? And it's, you know, you kind of gave the answer on a more developed or Western world, uh, what it looks like in, in the business aspect and also many things, but in many parts of the world, just as uh, uh, developing, especially mm. when you empower women and girls, it just changes our entire world. It's, it it's has a, a drawdown effect for human suffering and environmental problems that is in the 70% of uh, tile of, of abilities to quickly, rapidly make a shift in our world because women will feed their children and their families better. They'll, when they have an education, they'll go on to, to better our world in science and innovations and, and other much needed areas. Um, there's just a whole plethora of, of, of bonuses that our world gains from having that that touch my my greatest uh, mentor and uh love of my life and best friend was my mother and she uh, and, and then after her it was my both my grandmothers that were the biggest mentors and examples to me in my life on how to treat other people on how to to live a good life and to um, really give back to humanity and to make the world a better place than they than they found it and um I'm so thankful when I meet wonderful women like yourself who are empowering women and girls and taking messages to raise consciousness, to raise awareness, to, to empower women and girls to live a better life, to, to give them the basic tools that they need to ascend to those different levels uh, because it's only for the good of all humanity. It's only for the good of all of us. And so I thank you for that and I appreciate your example. I only have three last questions for you, and they're all yes. 
uh, 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 selfish for my guests because they're all <laughs> things that my get my my listeners really need to know and hear from you that would make um, their life a, a lot better. And and the first one is if there was one message that you could depart uh, as a sustainable takeaway for my listeners that really has the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? Practice self-love. It's not selfish. Uh, and I think people need to understand that practicing self-love is not about being selfish. And you cannot help other if you do not love yourself first. Um, so my little like, you know, evening practice where I just put my hand on my heart and say, I love you is not for self-centered reason. It's actually for being able to come from a full cup to have uh, compassion for others as well. So I, I, would, I would really encourage people to do that. What should young uh, innovators, entrepreneurs in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? What they should be thinking about and um, what truly matters to them? What do they want to, to change? Where do they see that there is something that they can solve uh, where is their additionality where is that co contribution uh, in this organism that we've been talking about i really agree with you i mean that's so true most of the best innovations the best impacts the biggest things have come from people who experience it in their daily life and they say this isn't right i got to make the change or, or there's got to be a different way or something that i've learned and they put their own tweak or their innovation and learning on that and kind of personalize it. And it just yeah. always turns out to be so far reaching and impactful. So I, I fully agree with you. The, the last one is really, what have you experienced or learned in this long journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Um. <laughs> Maybe, you know what, well, maybe not taking things that seriously, uh, actually have a little bit fun, like be a little bit joyous. And I think my, one of my main approaches now, move towards life with curiosity. Like if you're just curious, you learn and, and the gift of learning new things that we like, that we humans, we have this wonderful apparatus of senses that we can learn and we can learn with all of them, not only our brains. We learn through our hands, our eyes, our ears, everything, right? So I will say that like learn with some joy, be curious with joy. That was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and that's all I have for you, unless there was absolutely something that you would like to tell my listeners or that we didn't get a cover that you'd like to quickly discuss. I'm done. I really appreciate you being here, but uh, I get, you know, I give this last bit of time to you. If there's anything you didn't get to say and you wanted to say, now is your chance. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark. You know, you know what? I think this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful for you inviting me and I hope, you know, listeners around will, will appreciate our conversation and feel free to, to reach out if, if there's anything think they you know collaborations is where i'm coming from your your voice is very powerful and i'm sure you will touch just the right people and yeah there will be many who will be very interested i'm so thankful for you ida and i wish you a wonderful day take care thank and beautiful so costa rica <laughs> thank you bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>